Okay. And we can go. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in the Texas Electronic Thesis and Dissertation Association webinar series for 2019. Today's session is entitled Beyond the PDF, Evolving ETD Practices and Policies to Support the Next Generation of Student Work, presented by Heidi rbc Callum. A few words quickly about the Texas Electronic Thesis and Dissertation Association. We were founded in 2009, so we're in our 10th year of existence. Uh, we call it Texeda. Texeda is free and open to anyone to join, even those outside of Texas. And all you need to join is to subscribe to our listserv, which you can find at that hyperlink, or if you go to texeda.org and click on Outreach and Communication, you can join it from there. And uh, there, we're a very low traffic listserv. We basically only um, send information out when um, we're presenting uh, sessions such as this. And our mission is to provide a network of support for ETD professionals in the state and connect them with organizations and resources that enrich the work that they do. This is our fourth webinar uh, and all of them have been recorded and we've had some really great ones. Um, so you're gonna receive an email at the end of this one with links uh, to the recording and slides. Um, but you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive that notification. And that's also where you can see some of our previous uh, webinar recordings. A few logistical notes, um, all attendees should be muted to prevent background noise. Um, we were having a couple of possible issues with this earlier. So if you notice that you're not muted um, and that option is there, if you could just hit mute, uh, we would appreciate it. Um, we are going to have time at the end for Q and A. Um, and uh, however, you can enter questions at any time. And the way to do that is you should, when you click on the screen, this panel of buttons should appear towards the bottom and you wanna click on the circle with a speech bubble and make sure that the recipients are set to all panelists and um, then type your chat message. If those buttons fade away, then just click on the screen again uh, for them to appear. So our speaker, Heidi rbc Kelm, is Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs in the Graduate College at the University of Iowa, where she oversees thesis and dissertation administration, graduate degree progress and clearance, and student case management for all master's and doctoral degree students on campus. Prior to working at the University of Iowa, she worked at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of California, Los Angeles. She holds an MS in Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis from UW-Madison and an MED in Student Affairs from UCLA. So without fur further ado, here's Heidi. Thanks, Clark. I'm waiting just to um, share my screen. And there it goes, it should have popped up for everyone. Hello and good afternoon to most of us and good morning to anyone who's on the West Coast. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm very excited uh, and grateful to have the opportunity to share with everyone the advancements that we've made at Iowa to our ETD policies and practices in the areas of non-monographic theses and dissertations, as well as theses with digital elements. It has been my experience that typically presenters will provide a short overview of their campus, so I plan to do that today as well. The University of Iowa is an R1 public in the Midwest. Our undergraduate population is roughly 20,000 students. And as was mentioned, I work in a graduate college where student academic progress and completion, including thesis and dissertation evaluation, is part of my portfolio. My office awards degrees in approximately 400 different areas of study, and we serve about 4,500 students. Relevant to my central focus today is that Iowa has a rich history in the fine arts. 
We are the home to the world-renowned Iowa Writers Workshop, and we were one of the first institutions to accept creative works to satisfy the MFA thesis requirement. Pictured here is the artist Elizabeth Catlett in two of her works. In 1940, Ms. Catlett was one of three students at Iowa to earn among the first MFA degrees. She is also the very first African-American woman in the United States to receive an MFA. With this distinguished history, how is it then that in 2015, we collected this from a student? And you can see it's a hard copy thesis with very few pages instead of this or this. Artist Fidencio Martinez was born in Oaxaca, Mexico. At eight years old, he and his family fled economic collapse and poverty and crossed the border to the United States, eventually settling in North Carolina. His MFA thesis work examines issues of immigration, labor rights, and socioeconomic inequality. As you can see from this GIF, from the student, we received a hard copy thesis with nothing more than a title page, a table of contents, a public abstract, and a one and a quarter page thesis or artist statement. Later, we discovered completely by accident that the student had actually created a rich and engaging video of his fine arts exhibition. In fact, we only learned about the video because a colleague was browsing the local newspaper over lunch. We couldn't help but conclude that we had missed an opportunity to capture something important. This case was particularly disappointing because, as you saw, there wasn't a single image of the student's work in the thesis. On the other hand, this video, which to add insult to injury, is actually no longer available not only shows Fidencio's incredible work, but also his interactions with it. We decided on that day that our aim at Iowa was to do better. The problem which concerned us greatly was the variance between what our students were creating and what we actually collected via ETD. Furthermore, we feared that as that what we considered a gap would become a chasm if we didn't get out ahead of it as more and more students were beginning to create born digital or non-monographic work and theses with digital components. Therefore, we set an aim for ourselves to, as much as possible, collect the most representative example of students' work, regardless of its form. But as many of you no doubt instinctively realize, this seemingly straightforward goal raises many challenging issues for all of us for thesis and dissertation policy, submission, evaluation, and archiving. Which brings me to where I'll start my story for evolving ETD practices and policies to support the next generation of student work. My aim today is to highlight lessons we've learned at Iowa from our journey to collect student work beyond the PDF. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll cover what set us in motion, where did we start, what challenges have we encountered, how have we been successful, and what insights can we share. So what set us in motion? In the fall of 2016, the National Endowment for the Humanities awarded over $1.5 million in grants to 28 institutions as part of the Next Generation Humanities PhD initiative. The intent of this NEH effort was to provide institutions with the opportunity to transform the culture of graduate education on their campuses, especially in the humanities and especially related to broadening career preparation for doctoral students beyond the academy. Iowa received a grant. I was keenly interested in these conversations which were started by the grant. However, as I listened to them, I noted that most of the attention was often devoted to reimagining the content of the dissertation, which of course is incredibly important. But it caused me to wonder, what would happen if the grant was successful and students began creating new form dissertations, such as museum exhibits, blogs, mapping or modeling? It was then that I realized that the issues related to the submission and collection of reimagined dissertations is also incredibly important. 
However, these topics never came up at the next generation PhD conversations I attended, which were largely led by faculty. So like any good professional, since no one on our campus was addressing these questions, I set out to do it myself. In the spring of 2018, Iowa held a regional meeting to explore what is commonly referred to as the future of the dissertation. Our event was titled Beyond the PDF, Planning for the Future of the Dissertation, and my desire to organize the conference stemmed from a very practical reality. Alongside my elation that faculty and senior leaders had taken an interest in reimagining the dissertation was a secret worry. My observation that no one was thinking about how we would collect new form dissertations led to a very strong sense of dread that one day our campus would discover that our office actually had no plan for the arrival of the reimagined dissertation. So one could say that the organizing concept for our regional meeting stemmed from my very personal state of panic that we were so inadequately prepared to receive students' future work. In my pitch to our dean for event support, I explained that I wanted to facilitate exploratory conversations on what I called our angle of the future of the dissertation, which I described to him as the role played by the thesis examiner, thesis and dissertation policy, and the platforms and tools that we use in support of the creation and culmination of students' scholarship. At Beyond the PDF, I wanted to explore the following burning questions. How do we collect the next generation of students' work? How do we capture the most representative example of the work completed? And what are the issues introduced when creative works become publicly available? So how did we start? Well, our conference was a success, and I'm still indebted to the professionals from 20 different institutions who took a chance on an unknown event. At our conference debrief, we challenged ourselves to continue the momentum we started. So what did we do next? We've tackled three pilots over the last several years in theater, dance, and music. With each, we've encountered a lot of challenges, found successes, but most importantly, we've learned a lot. But before I talk about our pilots, I wanna go back to the art MFAs for a minute. At one time, the University of Iowa actually collected MFA students' thesis art pieces. In fact, the art picture that you see in this slide is actually a thesis painting that hangs in the conference room in the graduate college where I work. We stopped requiring the submission of the actual art produced in fulfillment of the MFA in approximately the early 2000s. Sadly, although based on our experience, not totally surprisingly, I understand from our institutional repository librarian that these pieces are not part of the university archive. It was our experience with Fidencio's thesis that helped us realize that we had failed to sufficiently replace or update our practices to collect students' thesis artwork. As a result, we have lost at least a decade of MFA thesis artifacts. So the obvious next question for us was, what else have we failed to capture? Which leads to the first lesson we've learned at Iowa, which is that for most of us, there is likely a gap between what our students are producing and what we are collecting from them. We can't collect the most representative example of students' work if we don't know that it exists. And how we discover that, how we discover what we are missing will, of course, vary for each of us and from campus to campus. But the reason to care about this gap is likely shared by all of us. Accordingly, at Iowa, we've shifted our paradigm from a central focus on what we require for deposit or what we call the compliance or minimum graduation requirement approach to asking ourselves, what is it that our students are creating or what might be called the preservation approach? By making an effort to collect a fuller expression of students' work, we're rethinking our role in service to the institution. We see ourselves as contributing to its legacy. We see student work as important to preserve and not just a hoop or a step in the path to graduation. So back to our pilots. 
Serendipitously, around the same time that the NEH grant conversations were occurring on our campus, the Graduate College was approached by the School of Music to consider a new thesis type, a professionally produced recording with commercial viability. This pilot is represented in the lower right hand corner of your screen with the cover art from the very first score we collected. The picture in the lower left represents the theater pilot and in the upper right is the newest pilot with the Department of Dance. Each pilot has been guided by two aims. First, collect the best approximation or most representative example of the work completed. And second, proactively address practice and policy issues, for example, copyright, introduced when we collect students' creative works, which then become publicly available. Here you can see some of the feature characteristics in the theater pilot. The organization of this slide with a column for the libraries and one for the graduate college is intentional because separately and collaboratively, we each played a crucial role in the eventual success of this pilot. Important to this pilot is that the library was contacted separately from the graduate college by the department. I'll get to why this foreshadows the most important lesson we learned with this pilot in a moment, but first I'll quickly cover the features of it. As you can see, the libraries were told that the department wanted to create an online portfolio, that it would be created cumulatively or progressively across the student's um, degree career, that the library repeatedly told the department this was not in lieu of the thesis, and it would serve as sort of a database or a repository for departmental work. When the Graduate College met with the department, we were told that they were um, in the process of creating a web-based portfolio with the library, that it would be a single product, that it, they wanted it to be this, the thesis, and so the conversation we had with them was about what to collect. As I mentioned, we were contacted separately from the library. In the Graduate College, we ha had a meeting with the program and then we never heard back. While we wondered about the status of this project, the program had been actively working directly with the library to develop the online portfolio. So what happened? Well, on the day of thesis deposit that particular spring, nothing came in from two students scheduled to graduate with this degree. So we in the graduate college, not knowing that there was a misunderstanding, did what we always do and we sent those students a degree cancellation notice since we'd received no deposit from them. I suppose you see where this is headed. That correspondence to the students was met with a flurry of panicked emails in reply because the program director had erroneously guided the students to conclude that the creation of their online portfolios with the library was sufficient for graduation, which of course, since we collect through ProQuest, it most certainly was not. So the paramount lesson we've learned in general, but especially with this pilot in particular, is that working together with the libraries is essential. In fact, we've worked really, really hard at Iowa to establish a very strong relationship with our library, and it's paying off in many ways. For example, we would no longer meet with a potential pilot separately. In fact, now we do most things together. We've each been retrained in a way to instinctively think of the other and invite them to the table. Even though the library had told the program to meet with the graduate college, they never followed up with us. So this was an invaluable lesson for both of us, not to rely on anyone else to maintain our connections. Another lesson we learned with the theater pilot was to ask ourselves, what constitutes the thesis and what is the role of the narrative content? The department initially stated that they wanted students to produce an online portfolio as the thesis. At the time, we didn't have any experience collecting a website, but we told them that we were open to it. However, post-graduation cancellation crisis, when we negotiated with them what we would collect and what constitutes the thesis, we found out that at students' defenses, they most commonly provided faculty with a good old printed PDF. The libraries agreed with us that the online portfolio wasn't the thesis. You can see here what we collected from the student. 
we think that the PDF in this case is definitely more apt as the thesis versus the online portfolio. It's a beautiful and curated art book style collection of the student's work. And the narrative content illuminates and enhances the work. So another lesson from this pilot, one that we believe is likely to be applicable to master's and PhD degree theses as well. We expect that the PDF and narrative content will persist in some form or fashion for many or most alternative content theses that we ingest. I actually did not expect this originally, and I have come full circle on this insight. At the time of the theater pilot, we were actively organizing beyond the PDF. So I was fully prepared and open to collecting completely digital and non-monographic work. But as it turns out, the PDF serves most projects very well by capturing curated content and illuminating it through included narrative. As a bonus, the IR record now combines the thesis and the portfolio to provide an incredibly deep and rich representation of the student's scholarship during the MFA program. And you can see all of the different um, uh, stage designs that were produced by this particular student on the left-hand side in the design portfolios. At the end of this presentation, I included some resources, one of which is the link to the actual ETD record for this particular thesis. So you can see how the portfolio and the thesis are married. The next pilot I want to cover is the recording one. The recording pilot also taught us many valuable lessons. For the recording pilot, the School of Music had asked the Graduate College to consider a new thesis type, a professionally produced recording with commercial viability. For this pilot, although the Graduate College and the libraries started our conversations separately, after the theater pilot, naturally, we became very intentional about consulting and including each other every step of the way. There's a liaison librarian in the School of Music who was also engaged in these conversations. As I mentioned, we like to show these conversations side by side because it illustrates the silos in which we typically operate as well as the functional area blinders we often wear. So very quickly, the library was told that the program wanted a CD delivery to stream recordings. They knew mechanicals would be an issue. And of course, there would be some preservation issues with the material. The Graduate College was told that um, the program wanted to produce a sound recording, that it would be professionally engineered, that the goal was for it to be commercially viable or have commercial value. And I personally wanted a single workflow. The lessons we learned from this pilot relate to copyright implications of students' creative work and workflow practices. The copyright issues here, as no doubt many of you immediately realize, are very complex. Because of the scale of our thesis collection responsibilities, we ingest approximately 600 theses per year, and I know many of you probably ingest even more. Special, special handling instructions are really challenging for us. But the directors of the School of Music, as well as the liaison librarian, both wanted the collected recordings restricted to campus. We can't do that through ProQuest because of the way the metadata flows. So I was initially resistant to this idea because it meant splitting our ingestion workflow. However, the more that I learned about the copyright issues, the more I realized I needed to compromise. The copyright issues here were at least twofold. One, the project was designed for students to commercialize their work, and therefore they wanted it to be protected beyond embargo. And two, the mechanicals, which are basically the permissions needed to use a particular musical score, are often cost prohibitive for students. For these reasons, I relented and we settled on a bifurcated ingestion pathway. But this raised another issue for me. I worried that if the Graduate College received only a PDF to ProQuest, we could accidentally confer a degree without the other part of the thesis or the audio recording. Since the recording would be submitted directly to the liaison librarian, this split deposit model opened up the possibility that the recording might not ever be received. And we in the Graduate College would never know that. 
So you can see why I was hesitant to accept anything other than a single stream point of entry for the deposit. Once we relinquish that option, we either bind ourselves to special confirmations or handling instructions that we can't actually manage, or we introduce doubt. So what did we do? Our final solution, which I love, is the Digital Object Identifier, or DOI. Each movement in these recordings gets a unique DOI, which is then cataloged in the thesis. In the interest of time, I'll wait to see if anyone has questions about DOIs, and I know there are plenty of folks on this uh, uh, webinar who have much more experience than me, and I am certainly not an expert. But it is my prediction that DOIs may play a pivotal role in the collection and organization of not just our fine arts works, but also our forthcoming academic theses and dissertations with multiple and digital components. The beauty of the DOIs from our perspective is that once they are created and recorded in the thesis, they serve as a permanent link between the PDF and the non-monographic work. Again, this is another important policy and practice change, which I fully expect to transfer from the fine arts pilots to our academic theses and dissertations. But even with the DOIs, we had a workflow issue. For one graduation session, the school music didn't realize that the student was working on a deadline and actually needed the DOIs for submission with us. Of course, on the day of deposit, the day that the DOIs were due, the person who creates them was out of the office. The student had provided timely notice to School of Music personnel, but they didn't realize the urgency. This was also another close call and another near graduation cancellation. We felt that we had to uphold our standards in the graduate college. We can neither accept late work nor one without a DOI in this case since the recording is part of the thesis. However, I'm very happy to report that like the theater crisis, this one too has a happy ending. The DOIs were created and the thesis was submitted on time. However, I do think that our School of Music colleagues spent most of that day in extreme distress while sorting all of this out. So this was another valuable lesson for us because I think it solidified for the library the inflexibility of some of our deadlines and compliance requirements in the graduate college. And I'm sure I'm not alone in um, I'm sure I'm not alone in uh, um, our understanding of, of how we can be different in those contexts. We had tried to emphasize these points prior to the library, but it wasn't until this incident that I think they really realized that we have definitive deadlines, which if they are missed, will delay a student's graduation. This recognition on their part for an aspect of our functional context has been really, really helpful. The final pilot that I want to cover is the dance MFAs. What's important about this effort is that it involved active outreach on our part. After two pilots, we were now in a position to make proactive attempts to correct some of our earlier failures that I showed you. Notice how the columns in this slide of the pilot features have changed. Now it's the graduate college and the libraries working together to serve the department. Here's how we all understood the opportunity. In the Department of Dance, the performance, the dance performance is actually the thesis. Students complete a written thesis also. The dances often include copyright material or the dance may be copyrighted by the student. The graduate colleges and libraries, how we understood what usually happened with dance is we would actually just collect the program and we bound it. A lot of times it was less than two pages worth of content. We didn't find out that there was a written thesis until I found out by accident uh, working with one student who was struggling in the program. The recordings, the dance recordings, the videos of them, they would sometimes come to the library in one of two ways, but mostly they came as part of the departmental archive and they were never connected to the thesis. And then the other issue, of course, with regard to the copyright is how do we navigate the public availability? 
So this time we all met and we showed dance the theater IR record, the one that I had showed you earlier where the portfolio and the thesis are combined in a single record. After seeing how the, the thesis and portfolio were tied together and complemented each other, dance was all in for updating their content and their students' submissions. Previously, we collected less from them, as I mentioned, than many of the art MFAs. Typically, in addition to the front matter, the title page, students would only submit that one page type version of their program. Now, Dance wants to create DOIs for their performance videos for the very next session. They also want to submit their written theses, and they offered to submit the actual artwork from the dance program. This pilot is noteworthy because it confirmed the value of our prior experiences and achieved results. Because we had something to show for all of our hard work, we really didn't have to persuade dance about anything. They immediately understood the promise of what was possible just by looking at the theater example. So the lessons we learned from the dance pilot are the following. There's a lot of room for creativity if we are intentional about our goals. For the dance pilot, I had to accept another bifurcated workflow. But if I was being sincere about wanting to collect the most representative example of students' work, I had to consider what really is more important to me. The principle of collecting the most representative example of students' work or a single point of entry and a single stream workflow. For the time being, I'm okay with the trade-offs required to collect better student work. However, these experiences have also helped me define what features future ETD administrators should include. And I will keep advocating with ProQuest and our institutional repository for enhancements needed to receive these complex and multifaceted work. Finally, the fine arts pilots have prepared us for our first digital dissertation. Without our fine arts pilots, we would not have the experience or relationships in place to handle these submissions. As an example, just a week or two ago, we held a cross-functional meeting to discuss how we should collect the various parts of our first born digital dissertation expected for deposit yet this spring. Present at that meeting were numerous representatives from the libraries and the graduate college. Of course, we won't meet every time, and our goal is to establish guidelines which will eliminate the need for these consultations. But for the first few, it was wonderful to have everything needed in place to efficiently talk through our strategy and to discuss the important considerations we needed to explore, such as in what form can students deposits, in what form can students deposit which parts of their work? To what platform should they be submitted? to ProQuest or to the institutional repository? What role will the DOIs play? How long will we maintain the content? And in what form will it persist? As well as probably the most important uh, consideration, what part of the work is the actual dissertation? So now a few concluding thoughts. At Iowa, we see a shift coming, and we've begun to rethink the responsibility of the thesis office. While formatting checks and manuscript examination have been our central duties, we wonder, how does this change in a digital era? What formatting checks do we perform on a website or a blog? Accordingly, we expect the role of the thesis examiner to change as well. We see it as moving exclusively from managing back-end examination and clearance to also providing front-end support for the development of publication and preservation best practices, such as file type selection, ADA compliance guidance, DOI creation, and DRM or data records management planning. Additionally, I call the collaboration and preservation of non-monographic work a team sport. Our responsibility in graduate education to collaborate with the libraries more fully is not only helpful, but I would argue essential to handling these new form projects because we both play a critical role. 
Typically, the graduate colleges are the front end policy makers. It's our centralized and administrative oversight that often affords us the opportunity to ensure that all students have information about and are required to follow procedures which align with best practice. Our library colleagues are the experts in archiving content. They are trained and skilled in how to handle all types of media. However, they can only archive what we send them and we can only guide students on what to submit if we know how and what the libraries can receive. At Iowa, through our strong partnership, which I do want to emphasize has taken time and much grace to establish, we've been able to connect thesis inputs and outputs. But what do I mean by that? Well, now the library understands that we in grad ed can support their work by requiring and monitoring compliance with best practices, such as ADA formatting, which benefit them. And it is the libraries who let us know what is important and possible regarding collection and preservation. Our symbiotic relationship has each of us making the most of our role. After learning from the libraries what is the best practice, the graduate college can require preservation standards at the start of the workflow, and the libraries are in a much better position to receive the results they want at the end. However, this input and output relationship only functions optimally if we agree to work together to understand each other to reach our common goals. We've had many fits and starts at Iowa, but with time and persistence, we have reached a really productive place. So to summarize, what do I think we've accomplished at Iowa? Well, we now understand and actually care about the gap between what students produce and what we collect. We fostered a campus team to consult about different types of theses. Together, we are building an adaptive infrastructure to collect and archive the most representative example of students' work. And together, we are developing new workflows and ingestion streams. What do I think we have left to do? Well, we desperately need some campus guidelines, both centrally and in the departments. This is the next thing we need to do, is to codify all of our experiences into guidelines. Also, we need to answer the question, what is the thesis? For example, what is the thing, the scholarship, the performance, the work of art on which we are conferring the degree? Syracuse has one of the second round NEH grants, and they are doing what I think will be some promising work in this area. They are working to define both dissertation worthiness and what constitutes the dissertation. I'm very much looking forward to learning from our expanded ETD community as these conversations progress, as I think that's the next thing for us to get our arms around. So I wanted to mention two opportunities um, for anyone who wants to learn more. At Iowa, we are very, very uh, eager to be part of this community. Um, I will definitely be registering for the listserv um, through TexEDA, something I hadn't um, done before. And we want to mention that our colleagues at Purdue are hosting a regional symposium that was modeled after the, um, the one-day meeting that we held in Iowa beyond the PDF. Uh, it's called ETDs, A Giant Leap Forward. My colleague there has um, just launched a, a new institutional repository uh, in the Graduate College. It's free and it's on May 23rd, 2019. Again, this is relevant for anyone in the Midwest. And then of course, if you're not familiar, which I assume most of you are with US ETDA, uh, they have a national conference for theses and dissertations in September. And what I love about US ETDA, and I'm somewhat new to it, is that the focuses on collaboration between libraries and grad education. If nothing else, I hope that I've persuaded you that this work we um, have the opportunity to do together is what I think will help guide us through this next frontier. And US ETDA gives us an annual opportunity to explore these conversations and again to, um, to solidify our work together. So these are just the 
announcements for both of those items. And then the last uh, slide I wanted to share is some resources that I thought might be interesting to you um, related to our presentation. Um, the first is the blog for the Next Gen PhD grant at Iowa. Again, a lot of rich content there about um, redefining the dissertation and thinking uh, um, deeply about uh, the opportunities we have. Um, beyond the PDF, our meeting website, there's a lot of great content there, including the Google Doc uh, from our day of programming. I thought I would share a little bit more about um, Fidencio and his work. Um, and then the IR record that I mentioned, which is combined with the online portfolio, as well as a link to um, DOIs. And so with that, I think we have about 20 minutes for questions, and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing from everyone who's participated with any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, Heidi. That was fantastic, wonderfully informative, and really amazing work that you're doing there. And Really appreciate you sharing not just your successes, but also your challenges. So I think that's really important for us to talk through. Um, if anyone has questions, please enter them into the chat uh, box now. And any question you have, we have plenty of time. Uh, there is a, a question here about navigating the commercial viability issue. So um, how how do those conversations, how have you had those conversations uh, between making a work open access and someone um, wanting it to be commercially viable and, and therefore withholding access and, and if you have any kind of policies in place or anything. Yeah. That's a really good question, and I I, um, I feared that that might be one of the first ones that would come up. Um, not so, um, not not the le the least of uh, uh, which I think some people find concerning is um, that how can you be preparing, uh, in this case it's a DMA, for commercial viability? Is that antithetical in some way to the educational purpose of the thesis? And we've thought a little bit about that here at Iowa, but to be quite honest, I think that's an important part of this conversation that we haven't fully um, come to conclusion about. We do know that in the sciences, um, an, an equivalent might be patents, and so I think we've sort of allowed ourselves to um, rest there with that part of the conversation. But more importantly to um, what I suspect is um, kind of the, the thrust of the question, which is how do we reconcile the fact that part of this um, thesis would be um, suppressed, if you will, and not available publicly, and part of it is. Um, again, I think in order to move forward and learn lessons, we have had to accept that, and so it's something we've been willing to accept. Um, it's part of why I think the narrative content is so important and the DOIs are important, because these are all the breadcrumbs, I think, that link you back to this this um, this fine arts creative work. So what, what happens with these DMA um, theses is the student creates this recording and then that is submitted directly to the institutional um, repository liaison librarian and it gets restricted to campus. And again, that's just a compromise that um, I had to make in order for this, what has been a really unique and I think a really successful um, new uh, degree option for students, um, what, what I think allowed it to develop. I think they've had about 15 students who have now participated um, in what we call the recording project. So what we receive um, via PDF and um, what's submitted to ProQuest and then what goes through the metadata stream to our library that is publicly uh, accessible would be the liner notes, um, some of the narrative content which ex ex explains um, kind of the artistic uh, purpose and goal of, of the um, project of the thesis and then those DOIs and so those DOIs are that permanent record back to the recording which is um, restricted to campus however we uh, my colleague who is our um, our thesis manager she mentioned to me recently that one of the DMAs just got a recording contract with the work that was created here at Iowa and so I do wonder once that um, once that is finalized and um, 
you know, that, that deal um, is done and the work becomes um, commercially available, will, the, uh, will our graduate then be willing to allow us to lift that restriction to campus? I'm not sure. Um, and so that, this is something that we will revisit. The wonderful thing about these pilots is that now that we've had these experiences and we've built these relationships, not just with our library, but also with um, the departments, because we've allowed them, I think, to do some creative things in order to advance their aims, I do feel like we said from the beginning that we would be circling back to them and we would um, revisit some of the agreements that we made. But absolutely, that was the area where I was most hesitant. Um, partially because one of the students actually put the recording up on a publicly available website. And so for the, for the there were two that came through. Our very first um, semester had two recordings. One which the restriction to campus seemed appropriate. The second one, I was really surprised when I saw it out on a website and I thought, you know, why are we restricting this to campus when the student has um, published this um, in this, you know, her himself on a website. but compromises I guess that's that's about the best I can I can say with regard to um, some of those unresolved I think issues all right we have a few more questions here uh, could you provide an example of how multiple DOIs for student works are published in your IR Yep, absolutely. So we're, again, kind of tackling this um, with our first digital dissertation. So what we did with the recording projects is the students put them in the appendices or in a um, chapter, and that's all well and good. But we actually think the regularity with which we expect to see these digital objects we are we are thinking right now and i pitched at that meeting i referred to what if similar to having a list of tables and a list of figures what if we have a list of digital objects and that's where the digital object identifiers go so literally you would find it in the front matter and again it would serve as sort of this record and in some ways it turns the the thesis or the dissertation itself into a mini repository it is that link between the narrative narrative content that, you know, through a PDF will likely be preserved for the next 200 years or more, something that, you know, the, the software that underlies it will continue to be updated. It'll provide that permanent link out to all of the um, other objects that are important um, to, I think, supporting and enhancing that work. And so right now we're sort of flirting with this idea of a list of digital objects um, as part of the front matter. Um, we'll see where we land and we'll see if that persists, but I think that is what what we're going to recommend to our spring depositor is that that is how they um, how they uh, format that. The other thing I will say about it is I love DOIs because in the graduate college it really solves a lot of issues with workflow for us. But there will be a point, and our associate um, librarian has told me that, you know, currently they are providing, or not providing, but they are um, creating DOIs for every thesis and dissertation. So the, you know, the article, the work itself has an overarching DOI. These, these multitude of DOIs within that, I think there probably will be an upper limit since they pay for those. It's a nominal expense, but it could add up if students want to have, you know, 40 DOIs. I don't see um, that that amount being created for any one thesis. I'm thinking it'll be between one and 20 DOIs at the most. The 20 would be the recording projects where they have these multiple movements. Um, but for most of the digital dissertations we're seeing, it would maybe be five. DOIs for all of the various um, digital components. Let me know if I didn't answer uh, the question completely, but that's kind of what we're thinking about right now. Okay, yeah, that's that's really amazing. And one of the advantages to that is they'll be able to track citations and alt metrics and that sort of thing much more effectively with uh, those DOIs. Exactly. Um, so how how did you get support and buy-in from faculty for a born digital dissertation or thesis 
That's a really good question. Um, we're really lucky in that, well, first of all, I don't want to say that um, there is wholesale support. I do think that the grant that we received um, certainly started the campus conversation. And there are some early adopters on our campus, um, like there are everywhere, and there are also some holdouts. Um, that's why campus guidelines, I think, are so important. Um, we, I recently spoke with a um, digital humanities graduate student. He's pursuing his PhD in English. And um, I, I sort of, um, I, I told him that I didn't want to be sort of a damper, but um, be sure to check his, his departmental guidelines because what we have found is there are individual students who are kind of the pioneers who have adopted this work and they're trying to do it and then they run up against um, guidelines in their own department, not typically the graduate colleges. And I've talked with a lot of my colleagues um, who say it's actually not us whose formatting requirements anymore restrict this. Oftentimes it's out in the departments and so again, Again, when I mention campus and departmental guidelines, that's kind of the next frontier for us is to get out there to be looking at um, the thesis requirements, the dissertation or the um, master's thesis requirements at the departmental level because a lot of times it'll say things like a book length manuscript. So we've had to make one um, departmental exception. It was sort of a one-time exception. And then they did try to revise their guidelines in their department. And I will say there were a lot of holdouts. Um, this question of dissertation worthiness, I think that's why the work that Syracuse is doing, I think is so important because until we've, until we've settled on what is dissertation worthy and the outcomes that we expect a dissertation to, um, to show or to demonstrate, I I think it'll be really hard um, for digital projects and, and some students to gain full traction because um, a lot of people think it's technological bells and whistles. Um, a lot of times it's the format of the dissertation, meaning the monograph, that helps them sort of know it when they see it. And so until we're able to, um, I think, articulate the ways in which these digital projects are dissertation worthy, um, I think it, it might be a little bit of a struggle. But for us um, at Iowa, uh, we do have a number of faculty champions, and I think um, the other thing that has been, a, been beneficial is most faculty, when it's their individual student who wants to do this work, um, they become supportive because they see the rigor and they see, again, the potential in what students are doing. So I actually think this is something that will continue to come from the students. And then as administrators, especially in the graduate colleges, like I said, that's kind of where um, those partnerships, I think, are really important because we have the opportunity to um, cut across campus lines and, you know, speak to to all of our DGSs and try to help inform people about um, what this is. And so it's going to be a slow build, but I would say um, for, for us, it's it's really been the students who have been um, at the leading edge and they have been the pioneers. That's great. Uh, we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, do you have experience ingesting films and do you deposit student film production theses with ProQuest? It's a really good question. So um, supplemental files, I don't know how other um, colleagues, you know, participating have handled supplemental files, but supplemental files um, for us were something that we, um, I would say we kind of largely ignored. We didn't, um, we didn't uh, um, broadcast them to students, but we also didn't suppress them. So now, you know, through all of our explorations, obviously we're becoming much more um, thoughtful about supplemental files. That's what, that's how they would submit a film. Um, to us through through ProQuest would be as a supplemental file. And because we've never promoted our supplemental um, files, as you saw with, you know, Fidencio's work, we, there's a lot of work we've missed, and I suspect there's a lot of films that have just never been submitted, either because students didn't know that they could, and I, I'm glad in some ways that um, we hadn't promoted that because I don't think we were ready to deal with the um, kind of the intellectual property implications. So our institutional repository librarian has been very good. Every time she gets a film as a supplemental file, she does check in with the graduate college and we try to reach out um, kind of post hoc to the student and we say, is this something that you want to be publicly accessible? But again, when I come back to guidelines, now 
that we have um, kind of this, this mantra or this mission for ourselves to collect the most representative example, we have to be really responsible about that and we have to fully understand what we're going to do with what we get in from, with what we receive from students. We have to make sure that they know the implications of submitting to ProQuest and then to our institutional um, repository. I don't know about others, but for us, the issue is always that ProQuest will indefinitely embargo, um, put in a permanent embargo on something, but we will not. So once it, as, as maybe um, the question um, participant realizes, once it goes into ProQuest, I feel like the inevitable conclusion with our institutional repository is that it will become publicly available. And so again, that's an emerging area that I think um, we are, are still just getting our arms around. Okay, and we have another question about DOIs. If the DOI is not issued by the library for the movement or image or whatever the object is, then where does that object live? Oh, that's a good question. So again, we're at the forefront of um, collecting these and, and you know, we have about two years of experience with trying to do better at Iowa. And so our experience is that similar to Fidencio's thesis, I mean, that was 2015, it, it just lives wherever the student has, it, wherever it's hosted. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I wish, I wish, I wish that, um, I had a better answer from the standpoint that I, I wish that we, you know, hadn't missed the opportunity to collect some of these incredible works. But um, it was only when we started asking these questions that we realized um, the extent to which students had produced uh, incredible things that never made it through, um, you know, made, never made it through to submission with us. Um, so, for example, um, the dance performances, as I mentioned, um, some of those recordings are probably literally in the building, you know, on the computer of the person who um, who recorded and, and edited them. And then some of them seem to make their way um, to the library. So I do think, um, sadly, there's a lot of lost content out there. Um, and that that's me just being honest. Well, we appreciate that honesty and we also appreciate all the work that you're doing to rectify that and we can all, I think, learn a lot from what you've presented here. Um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, we have a, a few more uh, slides. Well, let's go. We do have one question coming in. You mentioned the complexities of copyright on music, especially performances. Mm -hmm. How do you handle copyright for music that is not in the public domain and that is not created by the student? Right, exactly. I think that's where the campus restriction comes in, right? So, um, you know, we we work very closely with our general counsel to ensure that students have access to the consultation they need in order to determine fair use. Um, but I also think that's part of why we've restricted it to campus because that ensures that it remains in the domain of um, educational purpose. Um, and so we don't have a better solution to that um, now, which I think is partially why um, some of my predecessors in the graduate college might have sidestepped some of these issues and why why it is that you know 10 years um, after we or even close to 20 years after we stopped collecting the actual um, artifact we didn't have a good replacement in place because these are really difficult issues and we have to make some compromises but for us that campus restriction is what we consider to ensure um, that those works um, are uh, kind of stay in the domain of, um, of educational purpose all right so i'm afraid we're out of time we have a couple more slides here um, Oh, I'm was supposed to replace that red text there with the link. <laughs> Sorry about that. But if you go to your chat, please click on that link. Uh, we do want your feedback. Um, we spent a lot of time putting this together. Uh, and so just give us a few minutes and let us know what you think. And if you're interested in presenting a webinar with us, then let us know in the survey. We are very interested in expanding and continuing this. Just a couple of plugs. The Texas Conference on Digital Libraries is next month and has lots of um, presentations on theses and dissertations. Um, the early bird registration for that ends April 5th. 
As Heidi mentioned, there's USETDA, and early bird registration for that opens on April 15th. Tuxedo will be uh, developing a $250 travel award to assist uh, members with travel costs. And remember to become a member of Tuxedo, all you have to do is uh, um, join the listserv. And then finally, some thanks. A huge thank you to Heidi RBC Kelm for a fantastic presentation. We really appreciate all of your time and uh, effort putting that together. Thanks to Billy Peterson Lugo uh, from Baylor for providing the webinar support. And on behalf of all of Tuxedo, we want to thank you for uh, coming and participating. And um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone and good luck with your conference as well. Thanks again. Thanks everyone and keep an eye out for the link to the recording and the slides and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you all. You as well. Take care. Bye-bye.